Uh, we lived in a constant state of, of fear. There were men who um, guarded our house every night because of Ku Klux Klan. This is where the march would go and the streets would be full and the white folk would come to see us march, but really to, to yell at us. I think as a little boy, we wasn't as conscious as you would think of the depths of racism. And so I think I wanted to be a Western cowboy yeah. and to get out of uh, uh, Mississippi. The idea is that you had to go somewhere to be something when you lived in the South. We climbed with my brother. He was the oldest that did the plowing. And then when the war came, World War II, he was old enough to go in the military. He had got into some trouble with a white man who became the mayor. But when he came out of service, he was in a theater with his girlfriend. He was targeted, profiled, the policeman. Well, he came up behind him and hit him with a club. And so he just sort of spin around. Think of a, a military guy just getting out of service, being hit on the back of the head. And the guy stepped back and shot him two times in the stomach. And he died on the way to the hospital. And I was in the car with him. This is where our kids went. This is where they went to school at. I was a very young child, but in the South, it was still segregated within a desegregated school. On the playground, they played on one side, we played on another side. Spencer and them used to say, nigga was our first name and nigga was our last name, you know? There was a lot that was going on during that time. Uh, we lived in a constant state of, of fear. There were men who um, guarded our house every night because of Ku Klux Klan. They were locking black boys up in jail and beating them, and they had locked one up in jail because he had uh, called and asked a white girl for uh, a date. This is now in 1970. That Saturday night, we thought that they were going to beat him up. And so we came up to jail to make sure they didn't do it. And they locked us in jail. That was the jail that we were locked up in for the first time here in Mendenhall. And the protests for the marching came out of that. I talked to the people from the jail cell. I, I told them that uh, uh, this was an opportunity for us to not turn back. This might be the opportunity for we becoming free people. And let's bind together. And let's boycott this town. And let's do what needs to be done. That's when all of the, the, the black families came together. That's when what you might call the Mendenhall Uprising started. What's the point of protesting? I think it's the body reaction to oppression. The march went to enforce the boycott. That was the method. This is where the march would go and the streets would be full and the white folk would come to see us march, but really to, to yell at us us writing 14 uh, demands, getting po black policemen doing this, integrating the schools, integrating the uh, shops. And it was based on those demands that the civil rights movement responded. In the end, all of those demands were met. I believe love and justice is one and the same. 
justice was the motivation for God's redemption. I should never have gone, but I didn't realize the, the depth of the hatred whenever someone in those days would get arrested in the pursuit of their civil rights. And it was like 19 students going back to Jackson. And they stopped those students and arrested them. And when I came up to get them out, and they came out to arrest me, and they started beating us in that parking lot, the sheriff said, this is another ball game. You're not in Mendenhall. And boy, he clubbed me. And then they started. It was savage. Uh, I thought they was going to kill me. They wanted to really kick you in your private part. They took forks and tried to stick them down your nose. A steel ball on the hand of a, on a club, it, it finally breaks your inside. Then it made me mop up my own blood. The brutality, the pain. There's a, there's almost a memory of dying. You can kill people easier when you, can, when you take their humanity away. The beating was designed to stop the boycott. They done it in a county that was more oppressive, that was led by, the, by a, a sheriff there who was a Ku Klux Klan. Boy, I saw the ugliness of hatred. I said, boy, if I had an atomic hand grenade, I would release it and kill me and all the people in there. I discovered that I hated them back, and I hated them as bad as they hated me. Then I saw I was a bigot too. And I said, Lord, if I get out of this jail alive, I want to preach a gospel that is strong enough to destroy some of this madness, this hatred. I didn't want no white folks around me, but they was all around me. One of my doctors was white. He would come and sit with me every night at the hospital until I go to sleep, every night. In that broken moment that that I was outloved by those people that I need to hate. If you don't forgive, you sort of have the pains of others as well as your own pain. I've come to the place now that I see humanity as broken equally. We need to try to turn uh, this into a language of love. Uh, we need to turn it into beauty. It might be harder to look as compassionate on the broken as you do on the well heel in compassion is an action word. Uh, when Jesus said he had compassion on them, they're gonna be healed. Uh, yeah, I think it's very easy in a racialized society to react. And, and our reaction would be just as bad as the initial uh, action in most cases. Whatever it is, we got to do it together because that's the nature of the problem. The nature of the problem is that we're divided. If you, if you would just decide to get together, the kids, and throw them out there, white, black, Jew, and Gentile together, they would have a good game. they play a good game without us. We gotta do it together. The responsibility has gotta be ours. I think I'm learning something, even right now 
the redemptiveness that is in Christ Jesus. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me.